So, how do you get good quality from your Sony ZV-E1? There's a lot of settings, there's a lot of ways to set it up. And um, the first thing you need to look at is if you have a fast enough SD card. So, the, the SD card I would recommend is the, it, it just the, the cheapest one. The cheapest one to do basic recording is the any one that says V30. V30 because with V30 you would be able to do 30 megabytes a second consistently that's about um, 260 megabits per second round about there and uh, that will cover you with most of your recordings obviously you won't be able to do professional stuff but if you're just a vlogger and you just want to capture sort of uh, or traveling or whatever then that's definitely more than enough and you can get a nice cheap card uh, maybe like a 64 gig or preferably a 128 gig v30 then the uh, it, obviously we don't we don't, we don't really want to record hd so you you want to record 4k hd is i don't know i think i think recording hd in a camera like this is you're under utilizing the camera then buy something cheaper so definitely 4k and what i would recommend is the 4k hs option the 4k hs option records in the h265 protocol which means the, the data is much more compressed which basically means that it can actually get much uh, higher quality footage and use less data so definitely the hs setting um, the reason why the normal setting is there is just for all the devices. So all the devices, if they need to play back the video, it records an H.264 instead of H.265. And some devices don't support H.265, but that's mostly all the devices. You don't actually need to do H.264 anymore. Most devices out there now can play H.265. And also it depends on if you're going to edit your footage or not. If you are going to edit your footage with an actual editor for on the computer, then the best is just use H.265 because then you can get nice quality footage in a small space so you can edit it with your computer. Um, the next thing you need to do is you need to enable proxies. So if you use uh, an app like DaVinci Resolve, I'm not sure if Premiere Pro can do it um, or what's the other one from Apple Final Cut I'm not sure how theirs work I know that uh, DaVinci Resolve can do it they can do um, they can you can give it proxy files so proxy files is basically it allows you to do um, to edit very high quality compact video compressed video like a H.265 file 4k 60p whatever you can actually edit those files very easily on a computer that's not as powerful so it's very important to do that so the the first thing you need to do is set up your proxy settings once you set up proxy settings it basically records the file and it, it, it records two clips or two files for every video record there's actually two files that it puts on the sd card so the one file is going to be the full 4k 60p file and the other file will either be uh, full HD which is 1080p or normal HD which is the um, was it 720p um, it, it doesn't really matter which proxy file you use um, uh, you can do maybe if, if your computer is not very fast maybe use the save the normal normal HD which is the 720p one and then in your software you have to import both files you have to first import your main file so your 4k file import that file into your project first and then uh, you need to tell your editor where to find the proxy files and then you'll see suddenly the videos play back a lot faster and the computer can just manage the footage a lot easier then it's very easy to scrub through footage to edit it to do whatever you need to do the the second thing you need to set up or if you if you if you're not going to edit your footage um, then you can sort of use the default picture profiles um, but if you are going to edit your footage, then I recommend that you use a 
uh, picture profile like HLG. I use um, uh, PP10, PP10, which is HLG. So it's basically like a log file. It's a it's a high high dynamic range uh, picture profile that's in the in the footage. That will basically help you to protect your highlights. So if there's areas in your footage that's very very bright, they won't be blown out and just be one white blob. It will be uh, it, there'll actually be detail in those white areas. And it does the same with the shadows, the darker areas. The darker areas won't just be a one big black piece there will actually be details in that black areas so you can uh, you have the option of either doing HLG or S log 3 so S log 3 is the one that gives you the most dynamic range but it does come at a cost um, S log 3 is not good with uh, certain ISO settings so if you're more leaning towards automated use of the camera where you sort of just want to put everything on auto and just run and gun and not worry about anything, then I would actually recommend using HLG or PP10. If you want to use S-Log3, you can uh, actually just enable S-Log in the menus. So in the menus, it works a little bit different than the A7S3, where, what this camera is based on. There you're going to have to go to the menus and uh, in, the H, in the A7S3 you usually use PP9 um, to set up S-Log3. Here you're going to have to do it in the menus. It's a, it's a little bit different. I don't know why it's set up like that. So um, the problem with S-Log3 is that you need to do your, your you also almost need to do ISO control manually because at certain ISOs um, the footage is extremely noisy. Um, I think it's about, the cutoff point is, I think it's 12,800. Uh, if you're below, let's say you're between ISO 3000 and 12,800, your footage is very noisy. But as soon as you're above 12,800, then suddenly the noise goes away and it's nice and clean and crisp. So you basically have to avoid that ISO range if you're recording in S-Log3. Um, with HLG you don't have that problem so you can record you can leave your ISO on on auto and it basically just record whatever yeah ISO you want to use or what it chooses to use so HLG in that sense is a little bit easier to use but it doesn't capture as much dynamic range then when you do import your footage let's say you do either S-Log3 or Three or HLG. It's very, very, very important that when you import it into your favorite video editor, that you do actually do a um, color space transform. Now, in DaVinci Resolve, you have to go to your uh, color management page, and on your first node, it's very important that it's your first node. Before any white balancing, before any um, brightness saturation contrast color grading anything you must first do your color transform so your very first node has to be color transform color space transform and uh, usually the sort of the standard practice is to if you're using uh, let's say if you're using DaVinci Resolve your color space should be rec 2020 uh, just maybe check in your PP 10 if it is 10, 2020 there on the camera your color and then your gamma uh, should be um, HLG. In DaVinci Resolve, you have to pick HLG scene, not HLG, HLG scene. And then uh, the output, usually for color and gamma, sort of standard practice is Rec 709. That's just what everybody uses. Then what you'll get is you'll get sort of a standard video output that can be displayed on most devices out there. And uh, yeah, it will look pretty good. If you do, obviously what can happen then is because you are basically converting it to a more primitive color space and primitive gamma curve, what you will get is you will get the, the, the problems with you'll get a lower dynamic range. They call it SD, I think. SDR, standard dynamic range. So what will happen then is in some places your highlights or your bright areas will be blown out. So it'll just be a solid piece of white instead of detail. And your shadows then 
will also be might be black areas uh, that are solid black there's no detail but now you have the ability of recovering it so you can decide do you want the detail or not you can adjust the brightness you can drop your highlights you can to get the detail back or you can raise your shadows to get your shadow be detail back now you have control so you basically record in a log profile like hlg or s log 3 and then after that once you convert it back to sdr now you have control so the log log 3 and the hlg is almost like a raw you can almost see it as like a camera raw although it's not a real raw but it's it's similar it's between sort of a, a baked in image and a raw it sort of sits somewhere in between it gives you a lot of flexibility when you edit the photos or the videos and give it get it to a point where you can actually um, get good quality or you can decide what you want to see in the photo you get uh, a lot of flexibility what i would also recommend is to record in 10 bit and not 8 bit especially when you're doing uh, these color profiles if you're using hlg or s log 3 if you use it in 8 bit then you you kind of lose the point of the profile um, because you're going to get banding so banding is when you get this like groups of areas that are a similar color and hard lines in areas that should be a smooth transition from one color to the next so where there's sort of gradients in your image like clouds you will get these weird hard lines in the clouds where it jumps from the one color to the next that typically happens if you record in 8-bit with a color profile and then afterwards you do some editing you'll get those banding lines which you don't want and um so 10 bit sort of fixes that problem and then if you do edit you have to remember that your proxy files are still 8 bit so if you do color grading, color grading and you do see these banding lines and you get a little bit worried you can actually just disable your proxies just temporarily just to see what it would look like with the original footage the high definition footage then you'll see usually what happens is these banding lines goes away so now you have your footage you've got it in you can render it everything's good you basically now have control over you're actually utilizing this camera to its full potential the next thing you want to pick is frame rate um, this is a big discussion on the internet i'll obviously make a video about that i absolutely hate and despise 24p i hate it with a passion i believe it needs to die um, you either i would recommend record in 50p or 60p you can obviously if you record in 50p or 60p you can just still deliver your video in 24p nothing's stopping you so at least you have the higher frame rate at least you have that data the data is there so how how you decide to do that is basically the country you live in so if you live in a country where the electricity is 60 hertz 60 then you need to record in uh, 60p so that p is the rate of the electricity in your country so if it's 60 hertz you have to record 60p if it's 50 hertz you have to record 50p um, and that you have to do the camera should do it by itself so when you set up the camera you need to select the time zone and then based on the time zone it knows what resolution it is that's basically the difference between ntsc and pal so pal is 50p ntsc is 60p so the reason why this matters is because the the hertz of electricity in that country makes the lights uh, any led lights flickers at that rate so let's say you are in america and you're recording 50p america's got a grid that's 660 hertz so all the lights flicker at 60 60 times per second they actually flicker but now you're recording at 50 frames per second so now you start getting weird things like all sorts of weird flashing in your footage and all these weird like shaded areas that run up and down your your images and that's because the the elect your your camera is not recording at the same frequency as your electricity grid on the country that you're in so it's very important to make sure that that is set up as well as when you're traveling when you are traveling find out wherever you're traveling to what grid they running on 
what's the frequency of their grid and then if you need to switch with this camera if you want to switch from let's say 60 to 50 you can't just it's not a quick switch you actually have to go into your settings and change your camera from NTSC to PAL and that is under the setup option and there you can set NTC or PAL it basically you can't really set it you just basically tell the camera to, camera to change it and it just reboots the whole camera and you'll see that the the frame rate options are different suddenly you have 50p and 100p whereas with NTSC I think you've got 24 50 and 60p and 120p so that's basically the differences then you're going to get nice image quality, nice frames, you can transcode it to anything. It's very editable and flexible in your video editor now. So the last thing is obviously sound. So sound, unfortunately, there's not too much to adjust. I'm just using the front camera or the top camera, but I'm telling it to just always record from the front because I do a lot of these talking head videos. I don't talk a lot when I'm behind the camera, so I just fix it to front. And then um, I usually set my level to 20. That basically means that if there's a loud sound or something, it won't actually um, clip the sound. Uh, when something's loud and it's clipping, it starts making like a weird, like a noise that's very like, it's not very pleasing. So you don't want to do that. So that's why I set it to 20 so that you really need a really, really, really loud sound in order to clip the audio. So that's basically the volume at which it records it. Um, then, yeah, in your editor, obviously, you can just take it further. And you can put some vocal filters on it to filter out certain vocals. Or drop certain frequencies on the equalizer. Or what you can do is you can sort of adjust the volume a little bit higher so that it does clip in your editor. And then add a compressor that only compresses it when it's above a certain volume. Then you get a bit more consistent volume when people are talking. So when someone's talking a little bit softer and somebody else is talking a little, a little bit louder, they sort of sound the same. So a compressor, so over voluming and using a compressor can sort of fix that problem to some degree. So yeah, that's basically the, the basics. You can use these terms and Google into the terms I've mentioned to find out more. But that's basically what you need to do in order to get nice, nice quality video from this camera. Uh, obviously, the, the, the basics also apply. If you want good footage, you need to get a good lens. I don't actually recommend using the, the kit lens. It's very bad. I don't know how people vlog with it because it's 20. It starts with 28 mil, so it's, it's so close. And you can't use dynamic active if you're vlogging. Yeah, you can only use dynamic active if, you've, if you're shooting someone else. So that's a problem. You need to get a lens with a low f-stop number. So if you can get like a f1.4 or a f1.8, that'll be amazing because then you can almost record in complete darkness and the quality will still be good. Uh, this is the f2.8. Um, so it's not, it is a bit on the high side, but this is a very, very small compact lens. So I'm, I'm actually choosing, I'm sacrificing a little bit of f-stop to get a lens that is uh, very, very small and compact, so I can always carry it with me. So yeah, that's basically it. Also, try to um, also what you can do is try to sort of keep the camera from shaking. You can actually. I've seen a lot of people that vlog and they they vlog like this. It's like really the camera has stabilization, but you can just try to sort of keep your hand a little bit more still and uh, stable footage is just so much more pleasing uh, than shaky footage if you have a, a wide angle lens so maybe like a 20 millimeter or less then i would actually highly recommend enabling dynamic active stabilization it really does do a very good job at keeping the image nice and stable even if you're vlogging and that just gives it a bit of a professional look and feel if the image is, is properly stabilized obviously some people would like some camera shake uh, I'm not talking about those but you can always add it in post after the fact you can there's some some filters and stuff that you can add that adds camera shake that's not too that is sort of a pleasing camera shake it's not too bothersome if you are not going to edit your footage one thing you can actually do is you can actually re 
uh, turn picture profiles off and just set sort of your normal picture some settings in your normal uh, picture settings and that where you can still get quite a lot of dynamic range some of them sort of sound a little bit like they contradict each other um, but what I would recommend is what you can do is you can turn down your highlights and then increase your shadows so that basically gives you a bit more dynamic range and then you can also increase your contrast which sort of sounds like you are negating the <laughs> the highlights and the shadow adjustments but it actually doesn't if you do some tests you'll actually see that it doesn't actually negate them 100 percent and the reason for that is that when you're adjusting highlights and shadows it does regional adjustments so it doesn't look at just the raw pixel value it looks at the pixels around them and then when you do contrast it only looks at the raw pixel adjustments so you actually do get a better image and then you can add maybe a little bit of clarity it just gives you that little bit of a poppiness and then uh, maybe a little bit of sharpness if you want to but i i wouldn't recommend pushing the sharpness up too much otherwise it starts looking like your phone and that's kind of defeating the whole point of the camera <laughs> so that's something you can do it gets nice it gives you nice contrast nice colors uh, just on the standard setting just with a little bit of tweaks of your highlight shadows and contrast and then one last thing that you can do is you can enable the derange optimizer that actually helps to further increase your dynamic range so that you've got more details in the shadows as well as more details in the highlights some of the other um, very popular options if you know if you don't want to edit your footage is you can use the cine profile now that's P PP11 or P11 and uh, that gives you a very nice image it's, it's almost like a pro look like a cinema look but you don't actually need to edit afterwards and uh, yeah then it's footage you can literally just send to anyone and yeah view it with your phone or whatever then but then I would actually recommend um, not using 4k HS but just using the normal 4k setting just so that the you're recording in h264 which means any device can play it back I would also then recommend to use 8-bit and not 10-bit because a lot of devices also can't play 10-bit um, and also 8-bit 420 not 422 420 most devices play uh, h60 h264 8-bit 420 that's sort of standard video any video you download from the internet or watch is in the 8-bit 420 um, X2, uh, H264 that's sort of any video out there that any device can play so make sure you use those settings so that's if you're gonna basically record videos on the camera and directly as is just send them to other people or um, post them on the internet or whatever if you like this video remember to hit the button and if you want to see more remember to subscribe until next time this is Steve ciao